All right. Hey, we'll go ahead and get started. I want to. I got a lot to hit, and I want to make sure that that we get through, and you have time for discussion. All right. Today we're talking about identity crisis. So in 1973, 1973, Flora author Flora Retta Schreiber wrote a book called Sybil. And it was a harrowing and supposedly true story of Shirley Mason, who was a young woman and psychiatric patient famous for supposedly harboring 16 unique personalities in her fractured psyche. So the best-selling book, it created waves, uh, it introduced the concept of multiple personality disorder to the general public, and then cases of this diagnosis sort from less than 100 people over history to thousands in just a few years. And so the book details the work of Dr. Connie Wilbur, who was a psychiatrist, and her work with Shirley Mason uh, using psychotherapy and different drugs and medications, including some very powerful hallucinogenics. Uh, Dr. Wilbur worked to uncover all of these personalities and through treatment bring Sybil to reintegrate and to live and have a happy life. Except there was a problem. It looks like all of this was a fake. So according to a 2017 book, Shirley Mason didn't have multiple personalities. In fact, according to one article, at one point, uh, Mason tried to set things straight. She wrote a letter to Dr. Wilbur admitting that she had been lying. I do not really have any multiple personalities, she wrote. I do not even have a double. I am all of them. I've been lying in my pretense of them. Uh, Dr. Wilbur for her part, dismissed the letter as Mason's attempt to avoid going deeper in her therapy. And by now, says author uh, Debbie Nathan, Dr. Wilbur was too heavily invested in her patient to let her go. So what had happened was that Shirley Mason, or Sybil, had gotten lost in her own false identity, and Dr. Wilbur had such a, a, an investment in Shirley that she couldn't let her go. Uh, they were both trapped. So Dr. Wilbur, she had all these book deals and speaking engagements based on her theories. She was invested emotionally. She was invested professionally. And as for Shirley Mason, it says this, that Dr. Wilbur was giving her 14 to 18 hours of therapy a week. Dr. Wilbur was coming to her house, eating with her, giving her clothes, paying her rent. So how could she give up Dr. Wilbur? So this was... Uh, an identity crisis in more ways than one. Shirley supposedly had 16 personalities that she needed to sort through. Dr. Wilbur had this groundbreaking patient that would define her professional career. Both of these women were so tied up emotionally, mentally, and even financially connected with Sybil that, it, that they couldn't or wouldn't step back from it. So sadly, the book Sybil ends better than real life. Uh, and the book... Sybil ends with a happy ending, and she reintegrates all of her personalities and lives a happy life. But in truth, it says that Shirley became an arbitrary addict who was heavily dependent on Dr. Wilbur, who paid her rent, gave her clothes and money, and supplied her with drugs. Or someone compared it to a junkie and her pusher. So the story of Sybil, it's, it's convoluted. It's very complex, and it's a rabbit hole. The deeper you go, the stranger it gets. And it serves as a very cautionary tale of making sure that, I, our, that our own identity is founded and grounded in truth. Now, we may not suffer from what became known as dissociative identity disorder, but we can certainly look to other people to define us or become so trapped in our own identity that we then don't allow for anything to change us. And the danger comes when we create an identity in order for other people to relate to us or us to them, and then when it no longer fits... We have trouble shedding this identity because we're too invested uh, and, and we're invested so deeply and, and other people have invested so deeply that to, to change would harm and cause ripples to all these relationships. And so when our uh, identity I itself is not rooted in anything that can, that can last, we're faced with either doubling, it down, doubling down on it or riding until the wheels fall off, which is what happened to Dr. Wilbur and Shirley Mason, or we're, we have the decision to, to reinvent ourselves every so often in order to keep up with shifting ideals, shifting standards, and shifting trends. So until all of us, you and I, we root our identity into something solid and learn to build our life on that foundation, we're going to constantly go through the motions of trying to find ourselves. And ultimately, this affects all of our 
relationships too because when our identity is fluid or undefined and not grounded in truth, we're not bringing our whole self into any of the relationships that we have. It's not fair for other people because either they'll only know a part of you or they will invest in a version of you that may ultimately disappear. Or we might choose to maintain a poor identity simply for the sake of maintaining a relationship with somebody. And none of these options, none of these options are healthy. When you have to live your life in such a way as to try to stay connected to somebody, that's how people end up getting into and staying in bad relationships. So when we talk about being undefiled, which is the topic of this uh, sermon series we're doing, we're going to be talking about bringing our whole pure self into a relationship. And the phrase undefiled comes from Hebrews 13.4. Let marriage be held in honor among all. Let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. Now, it might seem like a really big leap to go from identity to the marriage bed, right? It's like, well, are you just out of context here? Well, listen, what we do, what does sexual immorality and adultery here have to do with our identity? And it's a lot more than you realize. So we've made it clear in this group, this young adult ministry, that you are not defined by your relationship status. I've made that clear. We, don't, we are not known as a singles ministry, okay? Because we are the young adult ministry, whether you're single or dating or married or divorced or separated, widowed or however it is that you found us. And, and we'd be disingenuous, though, to say that relationships are not on our radar. I have performed 17 weddings since I got involved in this ministry, including a number of you in this room. I have at least one coming up soon. Uh, that doesn't count the ones that I've attended without officiating. Uh, but marriage, here it is. Marriage is not about two halves becoming whole, but two unique people merging into a beautiful unity. All right? That whole idea that you complete me indicates this idea that you weren't complete to begin with. We need to be complete people. We need to bring everything we have into our relationships. And people need to bring their whole, complete, confident identity to a marriage in order for the union to be successful. Because when they don't, cracks start to appear. And a lot of marriages and relationships struggle when someone starts coming to grips with identity issues that they fail to address early in their life or in their relationship. Now, I'm going to say this a couple times as we go through this. Marriage is not the goal. Maturity in Christ is the goal. Okay. But understanding it starts with any good long-term marriage starts with getting it right with Christ. So the context of this verse indicates that uh, undefiled references the sexual purity and the sanctity of the marriage bed. But the, the healthy physical act of sex uh, is the culmination of spiritual, emotional, and mental investment. And if you make that investment with anything other than our whole selves and a, a rooted identity, it's, it, we're buying on credit because we will pay for it later. In fact, many sexually... Immoral and adulterous actions are consequences of ungrounded and shifting identity. Now, I'm saying this, I'm going to present everything we do from a biblical perspective, okay? And I realize we all have different histories, different backgrounds, different things like that. This isn't about, I'm not trying to come out here and come guns blazing and, and point fingers at people. I'm trying to help us understand what it is that God wants. And so this is just the beginning as we talk about all of these things over the next couple of weeks. It's all going to come back to one thing, identity because we have an identity crisis in our culture. <clears throat> we live in a world where definitions are shifting to fit new cultural norms. Uh, not only have people shifted from this idea of being religious to spiritual, right? People are taking what used to be black and white issues and turning them to gray, or, or to use the more popular term, fluid, right? People don't want to define what a man or a woman is, not just genetically and biologically, but even socially, all right? Because, well, we don't want to, anyone to be able to tell them what they are. Don't assume my gender is the phrase, right? Accusations then of toxic masculinity or unhealthy feminism have caused people to guess and second guess their sex and sexuality. Uh, and, and it's even caused some people to feel ashamed of who they are. Uh, shifting gender norms have caused people confusion, leading to rejection of their God-given design. Here's one that I, I, I've been seeing more and more too, like, uh, it, this involves even our uh, basic identity uh, of race and skin color. White people are apologizing for being white. I've seen that one a lot. And, and on all of this, you say, well, that's crazy. Well, all this is connected 
with our identity in trying to answer the question, who am I? All right? And so all these are all things that we're seeing in our, our culture out there. And so as we move forward, as we move forward, we're going to talk about what it's going to look like when it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. And then we're going to look like what it means when men and women come together through dating and marriage and, and, and enjoy God's designs for sex. We're going to take a look also at what happens when we get it wrong, what happens when we, when we don't do it God's way, and instead we get drawn away by the world's lies and we lose our identity. Uh, because our identity will shape every relationship we have from, uh, and will guide our sex. It will guide our sexuality. And we need to understand then what identity is and where it is that we should be getting ours. So to do it the right way, we have to do it God's way. And it starts by grounding and rooting our identity in him. So let's, I said identity like a hundred times. Let's identify what identity is. And the, the dictionary is very helpful. It says this, identity is who someone is. Thanks, dictionary. Good job. <laughs> but going a little deeper, it says this, the condition or character as to who or person or what a thing is, okay? The qualities, beliefs that distinguish or identify a person or thing. Or I like this one, the, the sense of self, providing sameness and continuity in personality over time, right? Your sense of self that provides sameness and continuity in personality over time. So to put it another way, your identity is the root of who you are. Everything else you have grows from that, from your attitudes, the, the friends you keep, the clothes you wear is an indication of your identity uh, in a lot of ways. It's not only how you perceive yourself, but how you allow others to perceive you. And people who present one identity while internally trying to hold another identity, then suffer often from cognitive dissonance, which is your brain can figure out what it's supposed to be and what it's supposed to do. And, 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 and you know, as we've grown up, as we grow up and we go through middle school and high school and college, and we try on different personas, right? Like trying on clothes to see what fits. Our outfits, our music, our activities. You know, I've, I have teenagers, and it's always interesting to see the, the evolution of the wardrobe. You know, like, oh, okay, this is the new, this is you now. Okay, great. Are you wearing, okay, cool. All right, whatever. But identity isn't simply what we do. It's, it's who you are. It's who I am. It's who you are. And it's at the core of shaping your behaviors, or shaping your character, shaping your personality. And, and people look to a million places to get their identities, don't they? It's found in activism. It's found in fandoms. And it's found in sexuality. It's even found in our hobbies. Uh, it's an almost unchangeable foundation for everything else that you build on. You plan your day around it. You budget your time and your money around it. And you... Present your identity to the world. And often, I'm going to tell you right now, if, if your mirror doesn't reveal where you hold your identity, your wallet, your closet, or your bookshelf will. Okay? And a unique facet of the millennial generation, right, which is the, most of the people in the room, is the desire to live a life of meaning. So millennials 25 to 40 says this, you, you, you want to know that what they do matters. And as a result, we'll often gravitate towards jobs and causes that make them feel like they're making a bigger contribution to the world. And the defining question for the millennial generation could probably be defined, does my life have meaning and purpose? Okay? Does my life have meaning and purpose? Am I waking up today making a difference? Does my, you know, is there a point for me to be here today? And I see that over and over again. That's why when we talk about pursuing purpose, it's helping us understand that we have a reason in this world that we are designed by God for purposes. And there's a desire for us to know that you're a vital cog and, and for you to have a purpose and a reason for what you do. And so instead of working any old nine-to-five job and then just having your weekend, uh, this generation wants to do a job that has as much impact and significance as the paycheck. Okay, A lot of people you know, in this age range that don't want to work a, just a job for the purpose of just putting money. It's got to like, what, what does this mean? For me, I have, and I have those conversations with people that don't want to work McDonald's because there's no meaning there. Do you like eating? That's a meaning. Same. <laughs> you know, do you like he having the heat or gas in your car? So now it's a subtle shift, but what we're seeing in this next generation, the Gen Z, which is 25 and younger, but now is coming up, right? They want to be part of something that has purpose, all right? They want to be on the right side of, of, of history and will align themselves more deeply with causes that they think give them bigger purpose and meaning, which is 
why we see so many people gravitating towards like uh, uh, Black Lives Matter or, or the LGBTQ movement or Second Amendment rights or pro-life versus pro-choice, just to name a few that are in the news every day. Uh, millennials say what I do matters, and Gen Z says what I belong to matters. And I think this is why we see so much more political fracturing, this widening gap between ideological positions. Uh, you have people pick a side. You have to pick a side. And if you don't pick that side, you're on the wrong side. And uh, more and more people are aligning themselves and identifying themselves by these causes. And these positions have to be protected because if the cause fails, so does our identity. Now, for the person who calls themselves a Christian, our identity is then born what? Out of our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And, and who we are is shaped and defined by who God says we are. And as our creator and our designer and our savior, he gets to define what makes us, us, okay? Uh, the Bible repeatedly calls us this, calls us children of God, uh, saints, holy ones, heirs of God's glory, redeemed. This is supposed to be our foundation that we build everything and build our life on. Anything we build on it then is a result of this foundation, and it should affect our attitudes and our behaviors and our characters. And, you know, a lot of people don't like this idea that God defines our identity. A lot of people say, no, another one defines me but me, right? But let's be honest. Everyone is defined by something outside of ourselves, right? Every one of us is defined by something out of ourselves. We're, and if we look at from God's standards, we're either, uh, we're either conformed by the world or we're transformed by God, right? We're either children of God or children of the devil. Uh, we're either dead in our sin or born again, made alive in Christ as a new creation. And that's just spiritually speaking. But this is how God looks at us in all these ways. It's, kind of, it's a spiritual identity. And our identity is most often expressed by relationship and responses to other people and things, and our perception of ourselves and how we want to be perceived, and, and we want others to perceive us, are typically based on some external influence, fitting into a culture, fitting into a style, fitting into... Uh, something that just we want people to know that this is what we're about. You can put it on like a sports jersey, right? You know, this is my team, and you wear the jersey, and you have the banner, and you have whatever, and 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 we, because we want people to know that this is us. You wear the shirt, you you know, go to a, what's your favorite band? Let me show you. You know, people. There are people who are passionate about those things, and we all have different passions. But the question is, is what are you letting define you? And what are you letting the world see you as? So the Bible, again, is very clear about uh, when it tells us where our identity comes from, how that shapes the relationship with the world around us. And the Bible tells us in Colossians 3 to think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. So, why is this important? Well, think about this. If your identity is founded in something in this world, it can be taken away. Well, then what? All right? If you're an athlete and your body fails you, then well, then what are you? Right? Or if you're an intellectual and your mind fails you, well, then what are you? Um, if you pursue riches or money, and the market crashes, which it has, then what are you? What's left? Or if you're a committed churchgoer, which, by the way, is different than being a committed Christ follower, and people hurt you or, or uh, fail you or the pastor leaves, then what? If you put your identity into relationship goals and a person leaves you, or motherhood and you can't get pregnant or lose your child, or your sexuality, and you're not satisfied, where does that leave you? If I put my identity in being a husband and a dad, and I lose my wife or my children, what would I have left? Or in my job, and I lose my job, what would I have left? See, only by placing our identity in something unchangeable, something foundational can we have true freedom to express ourselves 
and to enjoy this life. See, and, and here it is, only the permanence of Christ, who never leaves us or forsakes us, truly offers us. And so by making Christ our real life and putting our identity in him, are we allowed then to enjoy the things of this world without fear that if they're taken away, we'll no longer have meaning? So that's the thing. I just made an example that no one wants to think about. What if I lose my wife, lose my kids? If I make them my identity and I lose them, yes, I will be crushed. Yes, it will hurt probably more than any pain. But that is not who I am because we have hope in Christ. And I will still have meaning in this world and meaning in this life as a child of God. If I have the best job in the world, which I think I do, and I lose my job, I will still have purpose and meaning because I am a child of God. There's one more note as we talk about identity, and I think this is, I think this is important. Uh, we do this a lot of times, and we're seeing this happening in our culture and, uh, and, and on the news and all these things. We have to be careful that we don't let ourselves be identified by arbitrary characteristics uh, or like skin color or biological sex. All right, let me explain what I mean. Being a white male or being a black female or whatever – it is not an identity, all right? Because when you say that it is, or someone says that it is, it, it, uh, it means that you assume that you are defined by a certain set of parameters, meaning that the assumption is that every white male or black female or Latino or whatever, Filipino or Indonesian or whatever it is, or I have Arab descent, it acts a certain way, it shares a specific set of values across the board, and, and, and that assumption is patently false, and it's actually racist and sexist. And I want you to, I, I'm telling you that because you're going to see this out in the culture that, oh, how come you don't act this way? You are a, well, hopefully, you're being referred to as a Christian. You know, but, but hey, I was, I, was, I was at Grossmont College. You know, I was a white, straight Christian male, which means I was wrong. <laughs> Even when I was right, I was still wrong because that was the, here's your set of beliefs. I never expressed my set of beliefs, but as a white, straight Christian male, these were my set of beliefs that were presumed upon me, right? So I say that for that to understand that if we let other people define us by what they perceive us as, it, we're already behind. So I, I just want to point that out. So the question is, how does, going back, how does our identity, our real life in Christ impact our relationships, sex, and sexuality. How does this all come back to where we're going? Well, here it is. Number one, God determined our sex. Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So sex is a biological reality that God determined when he created the world. Two sexes that serve both a biological purpose, but also a spiritual and emotional purpose. Men and women both are image bearers of God, designed to complement each other, and through their uniqueness fulfill what is lacking in the other. After all, the Bible said, the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Amen. I will make him a helper fit for him. So God determined our sex. Uh, number two, it well, says this, uh, God defined marriage. He says, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So God's definition of marriage is, is as we see in the Bible, between a man and a woman. And calling something marriage that God does not recognize by his definition does not legitimize it in his eyes. Legal on earth does not equal sanctified in heaven. Okay, But in that, for marriage to be successful... Men and women have to understand who God designed them to be as individuals. So marriage works best when men and women, uh, we are confident in the roles that we play and what we offer. I have to accept my role, my responsibilities as the husband. My wife has to do the same as a woman. And, and when we bring our whole undefiled, surrendered to God's selves to the marriage, it's truly a beautiful thing. It only takes one person for a marriage to fall apart. It only takes one person to quit trying. So not only did God uh, define marriage, he also designated roles for men and for women. I don't want to miss this, uh, but he did it for the benefit of both. Paul uh, writes this in Ephesians, Let each one of you, husband, love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. There's a, uh, there's a whole passage in front of that, okay? 
that talks about that. That's the summation. But God doesn't leave us to figure out what the roles we play are. He tells us in his word. But it's not about designating who does what chores and who works or the division of labor in the household. It's not about that at all. In fact, it's about honoring God and creating a home that reflects the divine Godhead and God's relationship with his people. We're going to see this in the coming weeks. And fourth, God designed us sexually. Okay? It says this, God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. You know what God's doing here? He's telling Adam and Eve to have sex. God invented sex, all right? And we're going to actually spend a lot of time on variations of this topic, all right, that there's a lot of different ways to talk about this, so it's coming up. But let me say for now, the physical act of sex is a fundamental part of our design, all right? We are sexual creatures. But incorporated into the design are boundaries and guidelines that God has created. And the world looks at these boundaries as prohibitive, when in reality, those boundaries actually create freedom to enjoy that design in a safe environment, devoid of certain consequences, and second-guessing and shame. In fact, sex is so fundamental to our design that it's often the most targeted and manipulated thing by the enemy. So our relationships and our sex and our sexuality, they're all part of God's designs, and any deviations from that design will always lead to disappointment and disaster. If you want to see more about that, go read Romans 1, 18 through 32. But just to, as you engage and you want to look at that. So we're going to talk about all this and more in the, in, in the coming weeks. So what? Well, okay. Where are we going with all this? Well, Shirley Mason and Dr. Wilbur were so intertwined with the identity or identities, right, of Sybil, they could not unshackle themselves without losing themselves. Instead of a therapist helping a young woman find her true identity, value, and worth, the two of them created a codependent relationship where they could only exist if the other was willing to play along. They even recruited an author who documented their journey, and even despite the author's doubts, served, she wrote this book which only served to spread their warped observations, causing others to question their true identities as well. And this is what happens in the world today. As long as we keep playing along and feeding and promoting identities based on anything other than what our designer, God, intended, we only serve to spread the lie that you can be anything and find true joy or contentment or purpose. And ultimately, this hurts our relationships with other people as we never bring our true God-designed, God-honoring self. Now, the fact is we all have an identity. We do. We do. And we, and we all put on some persona that shapes us, and as the dictionary says, uh, I like this, provides sameness and continuity in personality. But which one frees us? And which one shackles us? Which one gives us the freedom to explore all the opportunities that God offers while protecting us by his boundaries? And which ones force us to conform to external expectations as a part of displaying that identity? Or better yet, how many identities ask us to conform and which one transforms. And we have a lot of options about where we get our identity, but if we want to live in the freedom of the life that God offers, bring our best into every relationship by bringing our undefiled and pure self, then we must do, as Paul says, put on your new nature. Be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Because in this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. And let's note some of these people these were identities for some people. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. So when we get this right, making Christ our, our identity, so many other things will fall into place. So consider today, where do you get your identity? Because it all goes from there. Father, thank you for the time to look at the word of God. This could have been so much more, so much longer to dive and dive and dive into this. 